Come let us bow at His feet He has the great things See what our Savior has done See how His love overcome He has the great things He has the great things Sing this out Savior. God, you've been faithful forevermore. God, I pray that you would be with us this morning. Guide us for your glory, for your will, not our own, in what happens here in this place this morning. We know you're here, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated. So you guys know if I stay up here and keep talking, you know what that means. Steph is not here this morning. <laughs> But I'm not going to tell you why, because we recorded a video that you're going to get to see later. So I'll just let him tell you. But uh, as we get into announcements, we have a lot. We have Easter Ninja Stars, as you see, it just <laughs> flew out. Um, we do have our Easter invites. They are cool circles. They're available on the table in the hallway. I invite you to pick some up and invite your friends, invite your neighbors. 
random people off the street to come and join you in celebrating our risen Savior on April 4th. We're going to be having two services at the community hall. So we're going to go over there that way. Uh, we can kind of consolidate. and There's more room over there and have those two services together celebrating our risen Christ. Uh, so make sure you grab uh, some of these on your way out. A couple other things. Excited. The beginning of April is when Chad and Alicia get here. Chad is going to be our new uh, evangelism and discipleship missions pastor. And so looking forward to him being here. And I get to kind of share an early um, announcement for him before he even gets here. Has anyone heard about the Will Graham celebration that's coming to Rapid City? All right, I see some of you guys have heard of that. So in similar to how Billy Graham had the Crusades, the big uh, evangelism worship events, uh, they're going to be having one uh, put on in Rapid City coming in the fall. And in preparation for that, they're doing free evangelism training throughout the Black Hills over the next few months. And Connection Spearfish is hosting one of those evangelism sessions, and we're going to be joining in with that April 17th, 24th, and May 1st. Those are all Saturdays. They're going to be Saturday morning. I think they're 930 to 1130. So that'd be a great opportunity to come and get some really uh, good evangelism training. Uh, and the idea for that, kind of the reason they're putting it on, is then inviting you to go and help with the event, but that's not like you're obligating to do that. It's, it's just they're wanting to help our community grow in our uh, abilities as the, the kind of the, the more practical sides of evangelism, right? It never uh, is a bad idea to prepare and to know those type of things. And so if you'd like to come, Chad's going to be leading that. We're going to be taking a church van. What a great opportunity to get to know him and, and uh, do that ministry together. Another thing is the Bismarck mission trip. For those of you who have been considering going on our Bismarck mission trip to help out with Hope City Church in Bismarck, um, Chris Wallace, the pastor there, has been asked to speak at the student camp in North Dakota. So we moved our dates. They were the same dates. So our mission trip to Bismarck is going to be June 3rd through the 6th. And I'm excited to announce that for that, we're actually going to be doing two simultaneous trips. We're going to be doing the adult trip, which will be fun. But then we're also doing a student trip, which will be even more fun. <laughs> and so we're going to be going up there and just kind of, you know, the, the, the things that we'll be doing will both be in the, in the goal of helping Hope City Church reach Bismarck for uh, the gospel and for his glory. But in that, you know, we'll be doing slightly different things during the day. Uh, the students will be doing one thing while the adults are doing the other. So I wanted to put that before you. Uh, I already talked about Easter, and Stefan's video is coming later. So stay tuned for that. And uh, I'm going to pray for us before we continue in worship. God, we do thank you. God, as we have all these things on the agenda, um, they're exciting, and I pray that they wouldn't just be for busyness' sake. God, they wouldn't at all be, God, for the growth or the glory of this church, of Connection Church, the name, Lord, but let us be joining in uh, to kingdom work, Lord, to being your hands and feet as you've called us, Lord. You are on the move. You are the power to revive this land. You are the power to change hearts in this community and the communities all around, God. And so we just want to join in with that, to be the hands and feet, to have the privilege uh, to be used by you, God, in sharing the gospel of growing people in their love for you and their knowledge of you. So whether it be the mission trip, God, this, this Graham uh, uh, celebration event that's going to be happening in Rapid, God, whatever it may be, let us be seeking, God, to worship you and adore you in it, God, and to serve you faithfully, knowing that you are the power in it all. God, we are so dependent on you as we are going to sing, we need you desperately. I pray that you would guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue in that. Without you 
singing this song of our dependence on God, how we need him for our every breath in our lungs, give him the glory for the life that we have. We sing this song about the exodus of God leading the Israelites through the wilderness, providing for them. We think of the manna, the food, provision, the, the fiery, cloudy pillar that guided them on the way all the while leading them to the promise God had given them. The times were difficult and at times they doubted, but God never left to forsake them. As we sing this, let's think of his provision, his guidance in our own life. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim thirst again. Open now the crystal fountain, and the healing stream doth flow. Let the fire and cloudy fill me all my journey through. Strong
Just as they were brought safely to Canaan's side, to the promised land, you know God's promises are sure in our lives. Let's give Him our anxious fears this morning and trust in Him. so much for your provision in our life. Guys, we are to have a reverent fear of our great and powerful God. We are not to have an anxious fear of this world. God, for you have conquered sin and death, the grave. As we will celebrate soon, you are alive and reigning today. We thank you for that, God. We pray that you would guide us now in your word. In Jesus' name. guys can be seated and we're going to watch a video and then Matt's going to come. Good morning, Connection Church. Uh, I have the opportunity this morning to be in Bismarck at Hope City Church, worshiping with that church family. Chris Wallace is the pastor and he has preached here at our church a couple of times. I know many of you are familiar with him and, and, and remember him being here. Uh, so this is a very rare opportunity for me to be able to actually just kind of be a, a church member this morning. I get to sit and listen and be taught and be fed and sing and I uh, don't really have any responsibilities this morning. And so I'm, I am excited about that. I miss being with you guys. I always miss my church family. Uh, yesterday, I spoke at a conference and uh, just went ahead and decided to stay the weekend and, and encourage Hope City Church and Chris and his family and be encouraged as well. So this morning, we have Matt Haddon with us here in Bell. And uh, I'm very excited for you to hear from him. Uh, he's preached at our church a couple of times also in the past. And uh, Matt and his wife, Amanda, and family have been on the Pine Ridge Reservation for, I believe, around a decade. Uh, and, and Matt, if you're watching this right now and I gave the wrong timeline there, please correct that. But I think it's around a decade that you have been there and your family and uh, had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to, to go and spend a few hours with Matt and, uh, and, and some of his co-workers there and just see the work they're doing there. And I was humbled by what I saw and the incredible ways that God is using he and his family and others there. And so I'm sure he'll share a little bit more about that this morning. But hope you guys have a wonderful service this morning. Always miss my church family when I'm out, but uh, I know that God is going to speak uh, this morning in great ways. So I hope you have a wonderful service. Thank you, Stefan. <laughs> Good morning. As he said, my name is Matt. I, I don't remember the last time I was here. I, I was really trying to think about it, but time gets really murky sometimes, especially these times of, that we live in. It seems like time, it seems like we skipped a year almost. I don't know, so it really throws things off. Um, but I think it's been two or three years since I was here last. So thank you for having me today. Um, Stefan's never here when I'm here, so I really don't know how to take that. I can either be offended or... <laughs> or honored and privileged that he trusts me enough to be here while he's not here. And I choose to take it that way, so I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to be here. Thank you, and uh, I'm grateful he gives me the opportunity to, to do just that. I'm married to Amanda, and she's down here on the front if you haven't met uh, our, my family. And then uh, we have three children, Jacob, Leah, and Noah, I believe, is in the children's ministry. Uh, so 
<clears throat> we have actually lived here right at nine years uh, since we moved up here to South Dakota, so almost a decade, but not quite. And uh, I came up on a short uh, one-week mission trip from our church down in South uh, Atlanta, Georgia area. And uh, it was in that week that God moved um, to where in a few months we were moving to South Dakota. And uh, so that was nine years ago. <clears throat> Our original calling, I guess, of God moving us up here was just to really whatever. We didn't know what we were getting into. We didn't, we didn't have any specific, you know, idea. It was just come alongside the church that was existing there and the pastor there and serving alongside of him and to help start a kids camp. Um, and so this will be the 10th anniversary at the Chanku Wash Day Ranch, um, where uh, my wife, Amanda, and I have a key role in just um, developing that and making sure it goes and happens. But uh, when we first came along, that was just getting started. And, um, and so we've seen God just bless uh, the ministry over and over and over again through the years of just kind of setting a vision out there of a, a way to, um, to love and to care and, and just to pursue the younger generation of the Lakota people. And so we send buses out in a 30-mile radius. Um, it's a day camp, so on Monday through Friday, and we bring them to the camp and basically do a glorified uh, VBS. Uh, it's a VBS, but it's, we have uh, 150 acres with a lot of different activities there, so it's more than most churches can do uh, in their church property. So we have everything from uh, water day where we have water slide and water games and things like that um, to basketball courts and things like that. So it's, it's a much it's better than just a regular VBS, but it's still the same theme of, of giving uh, just Bible school training, Bible lessons, and we try to connect those with the Lakota values. So each week is a different theme, um, and we just kind of grow and expand those every year. And so God's given us vision for that and, and has allowed it to happen, and so it's been exciting to see that uh, take place. Um, and we were serving alongside the church, and um, I guess about five years ago, the Lord gave the opportunity for me to begin to pastor that church at Sharps Corner. Um, so I don't know if you've ever been down towards Pine Ridge, the town of Pine Ridge through the reservation. You go through a little uh, area called Sharps Corner. It's, it's the, <laughs> you can't miss it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a gas station and a church. That's our church. Uh, so if you're heading down 27 towards Pine Ridge, you go right through there. It's not the geographical center of the reservation, uh, but many people call Sharps Corner the center because it's basically where you have to kind of go through it to get to Rapid or anywhere else. So folks from Kyle, I mean, from the east and west and all that, that's just kind of a hub. And so they kind of call it the, the center of the res, but um, geographically it's not. Reservation is a good size and it takes a little while to, to get around. And so there's sometimes there's people in reservation. Do you know so-and-so? Like, eh. It is a small town atmosphere and most people know at least the last name or somebody in that family, no doubt. Um, but it is a it is a good size area, and I don't make it to the town of Pine Ridge very, very often. There's some great ministries and churches around that area, um, but we're on the very north end of the reservation, and so the <clears throat> the camp is actually one of the first things you see after you come onto the reservation. So um, it's about 17 miles into the reservation. You'll you'll see Chanku Washday Ranch sign on the on the right there, and uh, that, so that's where we live and that's where we have camp. And God's blessed us to be able to do other programs such as welding and. Um, mechanic classes and even just working with however the Lord sees fit. We're willing and open and desiring to do whatever, however the Lord opens. And so uh, we found ourselves doing all kinds of different things, you know, of just trying to meet, meet needs wherever possible. Um, <clears throat> Pre-COVID um, was, uh, you know, everything was just rolling really well and you got all these plans, uh, you know, what you're going to do. And uh, that, that for us, specifically on the reservation, took a, a definite, definite different look, you know. Um, everything came to a stop, as it did everywhere. Um, it's taken longer for us to kind of get back rolling again, um, just trying to be respectful of the tribe's wishes and, and the people around us, and so being protective of, of uh, we live amongst a very vulnerable people. And, um, and so it, it <clears throat> just trying to find that balance. And so um, we've been able to have services on Sunday mornings since last July. So I'm thankful for that. We were able to start back fairly quickly considering uh, some places, but all our children's ministries, um, any other outside ministries beforehand, we were doing uh, jail ministry, um, a ministry f doing meals for dialysis patients uh, right down the road from our church. And that was going really well. Teen nights and Awana and different things, with our, all that came to a stop. And so just this month, we're, we just started Awana back um, this, this month in March. 
And so uh, we're, we're praying and believing that we'll be able to, to go back into things, ease back into things in the next few months. And we're planning to have camp this summer. We did not have camp last summer, and so that looked really different and odd for us. Um, I, I did not miss a beat of anything, though. I seemed bu- busier than I was before, it seemed like, in some ways. So I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but you're, like, doing nothing, but you're doing everything. <laughs> you know, so that's how I felt. <laughs> Um, and so um, it definitely looked different. One of the things that um, before COVID, we were even praying about planting a church um, in the Wounded Knee area is where the Lord had kind of put on my heart. And during COVID, um, the only pastor of the only evangelical church in Wounded Knee District um, had had left. And I knew he was already praying about leaving. COVID just expedited that. And so during the COVID time last summer, um, we were able to get the lease to that building where they were meeting, and um, it was a small handful, core group of, of believers there uh, that we know of, about eight to ten folks that we know of in that area that, that know the Lord in Manderson. Uh, so we began meeting with them back in the fall on Wednesday nights. One of us were taking, um, doing, just kind of fellowship, getting to know, and so in January we started having services there, and so that was our first church plant of um, in Manderson, which is about 25 miles to the west of, of where we are um, there. And so um, so that was kind of a blessing of, of the Lord just providing, of, of making a way where we didn't really know all the answers and still don't, but uh, just kind of stepping out in our face. So we have services at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning at Sharps, and then 2 o'clock, our whole team goes over to um, Manderson at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and we have services there. And we just duplicate the services, we duplicate children's ministry and everything. And so uh, we're grateful for that. We've been doing that since January. Had a couple of baptisms right from the start. And so we're grateful of the Lord moving in that. <clears throat> Pray for Manderson. Um, if you would, uh, just specifically, uh, just a couple of things I could ask you to pray for us. Pray for Manderson. It's a, <clears throat> I love Manderson dearly. I drive a school bus, uh, have for the last several years, and, and that was my bus route of, of everything south of Manderson. So I know a lot of the kids there. I believe God wants to do a great work there, and, and there's, a, there's a big lacking of, of ministry involvement there. And so this is, uh, this is really not just a new work, but it's in an area that, that really needs it and is um, uh, uh, just a great ground to be worked. And, uh, and so uh, we're excited about it. So pray for specifically for the community of Manderson, if you would. Um, and back in September of 2019, we began digging um, um, out for a medical clinic, a wellness center um, that, that we had, that Lord had just kind of put on our heart to kind of move into. We've, over the last several years, have used the medical trucks and if you give to the North American Mission Board, I saw in your bulletin to give like Annie Armstrong. The offering for Annie Armstrong goes to purchase and, and to give resources to areas that sometimes don't always get it and benefit from it. We've been a benefactor of some of those resources. They have these mobile clinics, a mobile dental truck, and they also have a mobile medical truck that we um, convert to an optometry unit. And we would go to the different communities in our area in the north part of the reservation, go to those different communities and offer days of dental work and, and optometry um, and partnerships. We were able to give uh, prescription glasses to folks. And so um, we were anywhere from two to 300 pairs of glasses a year uh, just in those mobile units. And um, dental work's a little bit harder to do when you need surgery or, you know, more detailed things. You can't see as many people. And so after doing that for a couple of years, one of the dentists says, Matt, I could do so much more if you'd build me a little clinic, <laughs> you know, something more permanent. And uh, he lives in Georgia, you know, but he was coming up on these, this medical unit. And it put a bug in my heart of just uh, God given kind of vision and clarity over the next, next thing of where he was moving us into. And it's not to cover uh, all, all the needs. It's, it's not anything like that. It's just basically taking the needs that are in front of us and saying, Lord, we want to try to meet all the physical needs we can so that it gives us greater opportunity to, to spread the gospel and to preach the uh, just to share the love of Jesus, and you see that in Jesus' ministry of touching people's physical life so that he could speak uh, the eternal truth over their life and design over their life. And we believe that God is calling us, and I believe that's a calling over the church as a whole. Um, we should be busy, <laughs> not so busy that we miss out on what God's doing, and not just busy work, but we should be looking for opportunities to meet people's needs. Um, and that can be wearisome, but that's why Paul says over and over, don't, don't grow weary in well-doing. <laughs> you know, you're, God sees you. He sees what you're doing, and so I've just reminded myself of that verse over and over again this last season for sure um, because it's so easy to get so busy and so many things going, 
and wondering, are we doing anything? You know, and I've, I've felt that several times over the last nine years. Is this, are we doing anything worthwhile? Is this working? You know, sometimes it's not, um, but I'm grateful for, for God and his grace and his mercy to kind of shift and give us wisdom over different areas and Lord willing, a continued willingness to, to make those changes as needed. And so I also ask you to pray for the wellness center. We've got it about 95% built. So September 2019, we started digging out and we had plans to build all through uh, the summer of, of last year, and uh, yeah, all, all our volunteer helps. Not, we didn't have anybody last year, and uh, I was completely closed down from that, and so, um, but thank the Lord, we were able to local help, and just us guys there at the ranch just worked away, and um, so the, the building is about 90% completed, I would say, um, but we lack equipment, uh, the dental chairs, you know, some equipment there, dental equipment, and resources to, to meet those needs, and, and plan of, of you know, God's developing it, but I ask you just to pray for wisdom over that. It's a, it's a big undertaking, um, but um, we've seen God meet our needs along the way, every step of the way, and um, I, I wouldn't have even imagined being where we are today right now in my own thinking <laughs> and planning, and so I thank God for that, and so I'm just working on licensing and those sort of things, so uh, pray with us on that, that, that God's will be done in that clinic and uh, meeting that physical need. Um, of really doing more restorative dental work. Uh, we also have an optometry room in there just to have a more of a consistency through the year of meeting the physical needs around us as God sees fit. And so I ask you to pray. Um, pray for those two things specifically, if I could. Um, <clears throat> I always like to uh, just to pass along what God's doing and engage you in knowing how you can pray for us. I want to thank you for just... Um, this church supports us financially, and I know sometimes I've been at churches and they didn't know, but you, you, this church supports us financially, and so thank you um, for just your generosity of giving and supporting us and praying for us and engaging with us in that way. So we, um, we are very grateful, and it would <clears throat> be much harder without, without the support of others. Um, I believe God has uh, amazing ways that we can never imagine. Um, he has chosen to use His people, and so I'm, I'm grateful for that. And um, <clears throat> it far exceeds anything I could ever imagine. So thank you um, just from our church and from our ministry for, for your support of, of what God has allowed us to do. So Stefan wanted me to give an update about ministry and talk about that for a little while. And then he wanted me to preach. And then he said I had 30 minutes. <laughs> and I got in trouble the first service. <laughs> so I'm going to try to be good the second service. I told Ashton I'm going to be my best behavior. I don't need, Ashton's not even in here. I don't think so. If y'all don't tell him, I won't. <laughs> he said they were going to mute my mic, and uh, he was going to come up and start playing <laughs> if I didn't end quicker. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best. <clears throat> uh, a few weeks ago, I started a series at our church called Holy Week, and the idea behind it was, I, I believe the Lord was just putting on my heart, even last year, praying through kind of sermons and, and things for this year for our church, um, for my home church there in Sharps Corner. Um, and it got to Easter, and when you're looking at the calendar, I don't know most pastors, I know for me, when you look at the calendar, there's certain Sundays you just pick out, they're just a given. Easter Sunday's one of those, you know. Uh, the Sunday before Christmas or Christmas right around there, you know, it's kind of a given, like what you're going to preach about, you know. Um, but I didn't want to fall victim this year of just blowing through Easter. And so <clears throat> I feel like, you know, sometimes we take Easter and Palm Sunday, and then we just kind of work all around it and feel all around it, and then uh, it's the most pivotal part of my belief and my faith in Jesus is that he's alive today. <clears throat> I hope it's the same for you. If it's not that reality, uh, you got nothing. We got nothing as a church. If Jesus is not alive today, if he's not sitting on the throne, we got absolutely nothing. And so it is, to me, out of all of the doctrines and theology, I could you know, spend days trying to figure out what is more important. They're all important. Uh, but if I had to do one foundational thing, it is the resurrection of Jesus. It sets him apart from any other person, any other being that we've ever witnessed, that we've ever seen, that we have testimony of. And so if Jesus is not alive, we got literally nothing here in this place and we're wasting our time. Um, and so when we come to Easter, it's so easy sometimes, though, just to preach a Palm Sunday, preach Resurrection Sunday and, and blow through it and, and really not carry the weight of the realization that Jesus is alive and he's well. And John says in 1 John, he says, how will people know, how will people hear that he is alive unless we, as the children of God, testify that he is alive today? John says this, he's, he's encouraging the disciples. How will anybody in the world know 
that Jesus is alive unless we testify that we have seen him, that we've experienced him, that he's alive, he's well, he lives within my heart. <clears throat> this was in that first generation of Jesus being gone. And John realized just the encouragement to the disciples there. We've got to tell everybody. We've got to tell everybody that he's alive. They're not going to know unless we tell them we have seen him. I don't know if you can say that today. I have seen him. It should be the first thing on our lips. It should be the praise every morning should be resurrection day <laughs> of just the praise that Jesus is alive. Every Sunday we should come in here as if it's Easter Sunday of looking our best, not to, not to appease or to appeal to anyone else, but just to worship Jesus because he's alive and we celebrate that fact. I don't want to blow over that. And so I started <clears throat> um, taking the days of the Holy Week, you know, of just leading up to it and taking one Sunday of just preaching through that. And so as I was looking for my devotional for today, <laughs> for the lack of time, I decided to revisit this from a couple of weeks ago because I thought it was fitting of what Stefan had asked me to share about. <clears throat> and that is um, what they call Maundy Thursday. You ever heard of Maundy Thursday? <clears throat> the word Maundy comes from the, word, the same word we get mandate from. It's a command. And it's the day to celebrate, the day that you look in Scripture when Jesus shares that last supper with his disciples. He gets, you know, he comes that long journey through to Jerusalem. He gets to the top of the hill of Mount Olives and, and he comes riding on a donkey and they sing Hosanna, you know, and they praise him Palm Sunday. And then through all that instruction, he works out getting the room for the Last Supper. And so there's a lot going on in these few days here leading up to right before he's crucified, right before he's put on trial. It was just like this peak, this high of Jesus how sweet the sound. Everybody loved his name. The very next day, they're shouting Barabbas. What a, it's, it's really a bizarre thought in my mind, but yet very relatable the more I search my heart, you know, and I hope you can too. So <clears throat> he gets this room ready and he has a last supper with them. And then he gets on his knees and he washes their feet. And the command, the mandate there is the communion with God is that to observe the Last Supper, to remember him. And at the time, this is before he's crucified. So put yourself in the disciples' shoes. They don't have a clue. What's, I mean, they kind of do, but, you know, <clears throat> I don't think they really had a clue. I don't, I don't think they understood that just uh, within hours, really, he would be betrayed. Within, within hours, he would be put on trial and crucified within the day. I, I, don't, think they, I, don't, I don't think they really had a grasp of that. <clears throat> but they're... The command is to observe the Lord's Supper communion, to do this in remembrance of me, of my body that is broken, my blood that is shed. I grew up in church my whole life. I've, I've, I've worked in churches. I've, I've volunteered in churches when, from the time I was a kid. My dad, you know, was never a pastor, but he was in church. He was the most faithful, you know, work day. We were there, you know, and first one there and last one to leave and just constant. Um, and some of the churches I grew up in, it would, it would seem like, and I could be wrong with this when you're a kid, you don't really remember, but I don't remember observing communion that often. You know, it seemed like months in between, once a quarter maybe, you know, and looking back on that, and I thought, why? You know, like, why? Well, I feel like just like we blow through Easter, sometimes we blow through communion. It becomes a, a second nature of just like a certain place on a calendar, and you observe it that time, and I don't know how you guys do it here, and I'm not, <laughs> you do it however the Lord leads you. I'm not, I'm not here bashing your style of communion. Uh, so many people do it differently. <clears throat> but I don't want it to be something that we as a church just kind of blow through it and it becomes second nature and there's no given thought to it. There's two commands in Scripture that, that God gives the church. One of them is baptism. The second is communion, to observe the Lord's Supper and to do this often, as often as you meet together is the instruction that we're given in Scripture, to observe, to remember Jesus and the body that was broken, His blood that was shed for us. That's not something that I get out of Scripture that we're supposed to just kind of put quarterly on a calendar or every other week or whatever it is and then just kind of blow through it as a second nature without any thought, just like Easter many times. It's a spot on the calendar. It's a great time, but not another thought the rest of the year. <clears throat> I look at this more as communion with God. I think this changes. It's not just communion, having communion together. It's, it is literally communion with God. Jesus says as he 
gets them ready in John 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I challenge you to read the whole chapter in your own time. I, I don't have time this morning, but read the whole chapter. You, you skip on down, <coughs> and there's even more, more scripture there in, in verse 53 or 54, somewhere right along in there, 51. <coughs> he says that, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Like, you know, and <coughs> it gets kind of icky. Like, that just sounds weird. Like, eat my flesh and drink my blood, you know. Uh, a lot of times people try to skip over that and kind of bounce around it, but Jesus is being very literal here, like partake of me, you know, is what he's saying, like partake of me. You will not go wrong partaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are not going to miss anything. There's nothing weird and hokey about that. We we get so self-satisfied, we miss the Lord Jesus. And Jesus saying, you will never hunger, you will never thirst again if you eat of my flesh, if you partake in all that I am and all that I've done and all that I'm about to do. Again, this is the day before. So they didn't even have full understanding of what's going on, I don't think. We're looking back at it now and we can see, like, yes, the Lord Jesus gave his body. His body was literally broken for me. His blood was literally shed for me. As if preparing a table, setting a table and preparing it as you have guests to come over. Jesus gave himself for that place, for me, for you. And he's saying, I am the bread of life. There's not anyone in this room, I don't believe, that doesn't have some yearning for something to satisfy them. It could be every different thing represented in this room. I don't know what yours is, but there's something, a a longing that we do that is our second nature that we think will satisfy us. If I had a little bit more in my retirement account, if I had a retirement account, if I, you know, if, I don't know, it could, there's one extreme to the other here. You know, if I had anything, if I had money for lunch, I'd be satisfied, you know, like I've been in those days in my life. And so Whatever our thinking is in that moment, we think if I just had this, if my kids would just act right, if, if this, if I could just get to, you know, for young students where if I could just get through college, I'll be satisfied when I get a job, you know, and then you get a job and you think this stinks. If I could just get to retirement, uh, you know, and, and it's just, it's always putting off one more thing that if I just had this, I could be satisfied where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes will never thirst again. This changes everything, folks. This changes the whole dynamic of our church as a, as a whole, a universal whole. The communion, the idea of coming together crosses cultural boundaries. Our unity in this room today is not that most of us are, are from Belfouche area or South Dakota even. It's not, it's not that you have the same vocation. It's not that you have the same age group and you get in these cliques. <clears throat> our unity today is Jesus. This is the design of the church, is that our common unity, that's why it's called communion, our common unity is Jesus. The body of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, that is our common unity. That supersedes any culture, any skin color, any language barrier. That's why there's other churches this very day on the other side of the world maybe have already, there was morning time last night as we were going to bed, it was Sunday morning, and they were getting up to go worship Jesus. We have a unity with them. We have a common unity with them because of the feast that was set before us, the table that was prepared for us. So how how do we get this as a church, as a culture, especially in our time frame now, where there's so much of <laughs> offense and canceling and you know all these things going on. How do we as a church avoid that without canceling out one another? How do we as a church avoid writing off our brother or sister in Christ? It comes with, a, I believe, a communion with God. When I commune with God, this makes coming to the table of communion that much sweeter with those around me if each one of us are communing with God. Our common unity is Him. I want to look at just a, <clears throat> something the Lord put on my heart as far as just, <clears throat> you see right here Jesus putting it as an analogy of this communion, as an analogy of eating. 
and you see this over and over again. Je- Jesus uses eating several times in an analogy, and I don't think that's coincidence at all. Uh, he has perfect wisdom and knowledge of heaven. He knows the need and the desire that we have to eat, right? <laughs> It, it's some more desire than need, but we have it, right? It comes from a basic, essential, uh, elementary knowledge that I've got to eat to live, right? Um, and so um, you might can fast for a little while, but eventually you've got to eat. There's got to be some sort of nourishment to carry you to be productive, to get out of bed, to have the energy to burn, right? It comes from eating. And so Jesus uses this analogy to eat him, (laughs) to eat of his flesh, to commune with him through eating. And I want to look at some ways that I do that just in the real world of eating regularly. And I'm good at it. I'm good at eating. I have a tendency uh, to make bad choices sometimes, as you can tell, right? I put weight on real easy. I can lose it pretty easy, but I also put it on real easy. So I have to watch sugar intake. And so the first thing I... I looked at when I'm thinking about this is preparation. The days I don't prepare, the days I don't prepare are the days I I tend to falter easier, right? I want to drink more water. I kind of made that commitment years ago, and I've done pretty good for the most part, but what I found is if there's not water available, I drink whatever is. It's true, right? So making the decision to carry a water bottle into a restaurant or whatever, just so I'm not tempted, because I don't like tap water. That's <laughs> I'm the diva, is what my wife says. <laughs> I can have tap water at home, but I don't like tap water out of a restaurant. I've done construction a lot of years. I've worked behind the scenes, and I don't, I don't drink that water. <laughs> I'll go drink water off the street before I drink out of a restaurant. Sorry, that's mine. <laughs> I'll drink Coke <laughs> and put that acid in me. <clears throat> So if there's not water readily available, I'll drink whatever is. Right? Many times as believers, we don't prepare to feast on the Lord Jesus, therefore we don't. If you're not preparing, if you're not preparing to meet the Lord Jesus, if you're not preparing to take in the Lord Jesus, if you're not making that preparation, you're going to take whatever's readily available. The moment you begin hurting, the moment you begin getting stressed or depressed or anxious or, or fearful or just desiring something you shouldn't, you're going to take whatever is available. So if the Word of God, if Jesus, if the fellowship of Jesus and the fellowship of the church is not readily available, you're going to take whatever is. And so I want to challenge you to prepare first. Prepare. Early I rise in the morning to seek the Lord. It comes with a setting, a table of preparation, of preparing my heart to commune with God today. The days we don't, the days I don't, you'll take whatever's readily available. Second thing is we got to eat it. One of the things I noticed is I can do really good at preparing sometimes. And I had a certain breakfast menu and all. I'm going to start the day eating healthy. And I go to the grocery store. You get all the groceries and you put it in there. And then all of a sudden, somebody brought leftover pizza and it's on the shelf. (laughs) Skip the good stuff. Eat the pizza. (laughs) You know? You get what I'm saying? At that point, it does no good to prepare (laughs) if you're going to eat the junk. So not only do I need to prepare the feast on the Lord Jesus, I've actually got to partake. I've got to eat. I've got to eat what's right. So many times, especially being a church church boy that I am, uh, you know, you can do all the preparation, have all the checklist of going to small groups or whatever, you know, and doing everything and so involved in everything. But then that moment you're alone, the moment when there's not that much accountability and you have the choice to eat what has been prepared, Eat what has been set before you and, and in accountable ways of, of the praying. Eat what you are praying for. You know, eat what is nurturing your spirit or eat of the flesh. The preparation does no good if you're not going to eat it. <laughs> if you're not going to lean into His promises, if you're not going to give in to the Spirit of God, Rather than giving in to your flesh, you can do all the preparation in the world and still find yourself as a child of God struggling and not having communion with God. 
and you think, how am I not? I'm doing all these things. I'm going to three services on a Sunday. You know, I'm here all the time. But the bottom line is you come down on a Tuesday or a Wednesday and, and it's not readily available maybe, or maybe it is, but there's some other option there and there's nothing there to, to, to keep you in check of whether you're going to eat the pizza or eat what's good for you. And so we give into the fears. We give into to ourself and the flesh and we don't eat with God. So not only do we need to prepare, we've got to eat and partake what has been prepared and thirdly, we've got to digest it. <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I picked up a couple of baby calves, bum calves off a neighbor friend of mine. And um, we've raised a few in the past. I'm not a rancher by any means. And some of you in this room, I'm sure, can give me some advice or tell me what, I, what to do differently. But <clears throat> um, one of them is a uh, mom had died during the calving process. And the other one, the mom rejected. And, uh, you know, the, my neighbor friend who raises cows, you know, done out everything he could several days, you know, tying her leg up, trying to, everything to get her to, to accept this calf, and she wouldn't do it. So he was bottle feeding her, but he had a problem. He still does. <clears throat> His tongue was hanging out all the time, you know, and looks cute. It looks real cute. <laughs> it is adorable. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's a cute little guy, <clears throat> but uh, he's, that's why she wouldn't accept him, I think, is because he couldn't latch on very good, you know, and just probably uncomfortable because I noticed when we bottle feed him, he's getting fluid. He's getting that, the milk down in his windpipe. He's getting in his lungs. And so battling what we thought was pneumonia, you can hear it just rasping, gurgling and all. And <clears throat> then he got to where he just wouldn't eat. He would start gagging and coughing. Um, he just couldn't eat the milk. So he just quit eating. And so the other night, I thought he wasn't going to make it through the night, and he just laid down. He wasn't moving. You know, just you could see every bone in his body. Not healthy at all. The other calf, about the same age as him, she's looking good, putting weight on, and got good hairy coat, you know, shiny, and she's healthy, and you can tell. You can see the difference. She's bouncing around. He's just laying there, and it's, it's sad. I uh, went and borrowed a, a tube feeder. I've never done that before, so that was new for me. <clears throat> and uh, got him some nutrients. The rancher, a friend of mine, said, just be careful, you know, if he hasn't been eating a whole lot, you might have to give him a little bit, <laughs> you know. Why? Because his stomach might not, could handle it. He had already had scours, it's messy, you know, I mean, just not digesting well. He's not getting nutrients, so his body is weak. I was thinking so much how we do this in our spirit. The moment we start getting something from the Word of God, it doesn't set well. And so we just give up on the plan. Well, I don't like that. That didn't feel too good. I got a headache when I didn't drink Cokes, you know, so I gave, I gave in and just drank another Coke. <laughs> you realize we do that in, in our spirit so much when the Word of God just doesn't set very comfortably. We're not used to it. So I want to challenge you. Don't just prepare it, eat it, but allow the Word of God to just digest in your system as part of the growth process, as part of us as believers growing and maturing in the Lord Jesus. Would you stand with me? <clears throat> Psalm 90 verse 14 says, Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Can that be your prayer this morning? There's a longing in my heart. Would you satisfy us? Would you satisfy me with your steadfast love? With the riches of your grace, with the riches of your mercy, with your promises, with your favor, would you satisfy me that I can rejoice and be glad all my days? We live in a time where things are just thrown out. Words are cheap. Things are cheap. Commitment is cheap. Everything's cheap. It leads to just more longing, more void, more lack. So can you pray this morning, Lord, would you satisfy me that I may wake up rejuvenated, rejoicing, and my spirit glad. Father, I love you. I thank you so much for this morning, Lord. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the leadership of this church. I just pray for wisdom and blessing over, over every decision that's made. 
over this body of believers here, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would begin with me to fill a longing in my heart to look like you, to be healthy, to reflect your image. Lord, that I would run to you first. No matter what the world has to offer, Lord, that I would choose you over everything. Lord, help me to process that. Help each one of us in this room to process that, process your word in our life. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Let's sing this together. So I cheer. Shame.